guys, God in Wheelchair here, and I'm coming at you with Deception of Religion number 15. But before we get started today, I'd like to make a couple announcements. Number one, your opportunity to buy the Guy in a Wheelchair t-shirt is running out. There's only a day or two left, so if that's something you're interested in, I highly suggest you go to teespring.com forward slash wheelchair atheist, or click the link in the description below and get your shirt before they're gone. Also, if you have a crazy religious video you'd like me to respond to, send it to me in a link on Twitter and I will check it out. Thank you. Today, we're responding to a video entitled Faith and Proof, in which a Christian tries to convince us, number one, that Christianity is based on scientific evidence and not just blind faith, and that scientists also rely on blind faith and not just evidence. This ought to be interesting. Let's watch. Can we provide absolute empirical, that is statistical, observable evidence for God's existence to absolutely prove He exists? If we could, perhaps everyone would be a believer. Yes, if you could supply empirical, observable evidence that God exists, everyone or almost everyone would be a believer. After all, most atheists are not close to the idea of a God. We just have not been convinced by the data. As a matter of fact, the data points in the other direction. If you could supply observable scientific evidence of God, I don't see why we wouldn't follow it. God, by definition, is beyond us in time, space, and intelligence. We cannot use science to prove Him or show Him to us because science is involved with things God created, the physical material world things which cannot measure and observe his spiritual and eternal essence. Okay, this guy just said you can't use science to test God because science only tests things that God created. That's like saying you can use science to test the existence of me, but you can't use science to test the existence of my parents because my parents created me and science can only test things that were created by my parents. Do you see the flaw in logic there? Nevertheless, we can come to know about the creator of a piece of art, for example, by exploring that piece. In fact, just the fact that the piece of art exists provides evidence that there is a creator for the art. Unless, of course, one believes that the art came together by chance. You just said we can learn more about God by studying his creation the same way we can learn more about an artist by studying his art. The difference there is, we can ask the artist about himself. We can ask the artist questions and the artist will answer our questions because the artist exists. And I find it curiously odd that God had the ability and the willingness to answer our questions all throughout the Bible, but he doesn't do it anymore. Like he just woke up one day and decided, I think it's a better idea if I communicate with people through clouds, toast, and Cheetos. To have faith does not mean that we only believe things blindly. Faith in God has mounds of evidence and reason to support it. First of all, faith in a religious sense means blind following. It means believing something without having any evidence to back it up. And I love how you say, God has a mountain of evidence supporting his existence, but then you don't tell us what any of that evidence is. You know why you don't tell us what any of that evidence is? Because the evidence doesn't exist. Moreover, everyone has and uses faith, including scientists, as scientist Dr. Stephen Meyer attests. They have faith in all of the assumptions that go into their experiments, many of which cannot be absolutely proven. He argues that we base many things in life on our unproven assumptions. Oh my god, are you guys still doing this argument? Okay, listen up creationists. Number one, no good scientist relies on faith. There are no assumptions that go into experimentation because experiments are designed to cut out assumptions. That's why we have a control and a non-control because that cuts out assumptions. And that's why experiments are repeated several thousand times before their data is taken seriously because that cuts out assumptions. Science relies on evidence. Religion relies on faith. Religion has no evidence. Science has no faith. Okay, get it through your thick skulls. As he puts it, nobody gets absolute proof of anything. Actually, with the exception of geometry, we can prove almost nothing absolutely. We can prove almost nothing absolutely? Okay, how many times in your life have you floated into the sky like a balloon full of helium? 
Never. That seems pretty absolute to me. How many times have you seen the boiling and freezing points of water change? Never. That seems pretty absolute to me. And the human need for oxygen isn't absolute? Go ahead. Stop breathing and see how long you live. To make this point clear to my students, I often use an example of getting married. If students are committed to marrying someone who truly loves them back, I may ask how they will be able to prove the love to themselves or to others. If you must always have absolute proof of something to make any action, how can you ever get married or do anything in our world for that matter? Sure, you could point to the physical evidence of certain neurons firing in the brain and chemicals surging through your body, but those hardly encapsulate what we mean when we speak of true, romantic, committed love. How do you prove that love to yourself? Really? Okay, because your partner says, I love you. That's it. It's that easy. Are you that stupid? It's that simple. All your partner has to say is, I love you, and that is absolute definitive proof that the love exists. Are you kidding me? No one can seriously require absolute proof in their lives because it is simply not attainable. Absolute proof is simply not attainable. What are you on? Okay, if I say I have enough power left in my wheelchair to make it to the store, and then I make it to the store, the fact that I made it to the store is absolute proof that I had enough power left in my wheelchair to make it to the store. We do not even know for sure if who we think we are and what we are doing is really real. Consider the films The Matrix or Inception, for example. Oh, are you kidding me? I don't even know what to say right now. Listen, this is what you sound like. We can't say for sure whether or not God exists because we don't even know for sure whether or not we exist. And how do I back up my crazy absurd statement? With two science fiction movies. That's pretty convincing, right? Whether we like it or not, God is a mystery to us in a much greater way than our language, culture, emotions, and intelligence are beyond the understanding of a fly. If God is so far out of our comprehension, then why the hell would you make a video telling people how to comprehend God? God is so far out of human comprehension, no human can comprehend God. Now watch me as I explain how to comprehend God. Does that make sense to you? As Benedict XVI, then Cardinal Ratzinger, noted, any attempt to reduce God to the scope of our own comprehension leads to the absurd. We can only speak rightly about him if we renounce the attempt to comprehend and let him be the uncomprehended. After all, if God were not a mystery beyond our comprehension, he would not meet the basic definition of God. Are you insane? The only way we can speak rightly about God is to not comprehend God. You're saying the only way we can understand God is to not understand God. The only way we can give correct information about God is to know nothing about God. Ratzinger agrees that absolute proof is elusive. However, we must also realize that while the believer may not have absolute proof of God's existence, neither does the unbeliever. No, you're right. We don't have absolute knowledge one way or the other. The difference is, the believer claims to have absolute knowledge that God exists. The non-believer doesn't. All the non-believer says is the data is pointing in the other direction. There is not enough evidence here to convince me that a God exists. The non-believer does not claim to have any absolute knowledge one way or the other. The believer does. That's why that statement is so stupid and you guys need to quit using it because it's not helping your case. Decades before becoming Pope Benedict XVI, he wrote, anyone who makes up his mind to evade the uncertainty of belief will have to experience the uncertainty of unbelief, which can never finally eliminate for certain the possibility that belief may after all be the truth. In other words, to reject God because there is not absolute proof for him is no better of a position because there is also never absolute proof against him. Now you're just using Pascal's wager. It's better to hedge your bets against the fact that there is a God because if there isn't, nothing happens. And if there is, you go to heaven. Is that not the most dishonest form of Christianity you can think of? Think about it. If you were a God, would you want somebody like that in heaven? They didn't really believe in you. They didn't love you. You're just an insurance policy. 
Since neither way can be absolutely sure, we must consider the evidence and reasons for belief. When one considers the evidence with an open mind, the path to God opens, as it has for many who have trod the first steps on the road of faith. Consider the evidence with an open mind? Sure, I'll consider the evidence with an open mind. Go ahead, show it to me. Go ahead, I'm waiting. That's the problem. You keep talking about this evidence, but you don't tell us what it is. You're not showing us any evidence. You just keep assuring us that it exists. How about you show us? If you can't show us that evidence exists, then I don't believe you. Such as former atheist turned legendary Christian apologist C.S. Lewis. Dr. Peter Kreef suggests, God provided just enough evidence of himself for any honest seeker whose heart really cares about the truth of the matter, but not so much that hardened hearts will be convinced by force. Sure, the evidence exists. Let's think about what evidence exists. Let's see, there's cancer, AIDS, starvation, poverty. Sure, the evidence is everywhere. Jesus is like a lover with a marriage proposal, not a cop with a warrant. Jesus is like a lover with a marriage proposal. Well, if that's the case, then you've been damned to hell since the day you were born because I'm pretty sure they don't recognize homosexual marriage in heaven. Sorry you were born with a penis. In other words, God only invites, he never forces. Perhaps he is inviting you. Okay, I'm convinced this guy had a big bowl of stupid flakes for breakfast. His major points were, scientists have faith, nobody knows for sure, so it's better to hedge your bets against God. And he keeps talking about evidence, there's evidence, there's evidence. How about you present him some evidence? How about you show us the evidence? How about you tell us about the evidence? If you're trying to convince scientifically minded people that God exists, you better have some pretty damn good evidence. But you don't even sound like somebody who believed God exists yourself. You sound like somebody who's hedging their bets against God. And if you're not a true Christian, and you're trying to convince us to become Christian, then your whole thought process is wrong.